going. Mm. This is the Lisa Baxter Show. I am so glad you tuned in on tonight. I am just so glad. I hope you got your favorite beverage and have a seat, your snack, or maybe no snack at all, because I just want you all ears on tonight. Okay? So before we start the show, one of the things I wanted to say is um, uh, Tamika James, one of the great warriors, has passed away, and I want to give condolences to her family. Uh, we under, we care, and we're praying, and we just sending out love to you and your family. Okay, we had to say that for a beautiful warrior. We just had to say that. Now, this is the Lisa Baxter show, giving you the four one one in the kidney world. Well, again, hi again, and I'm so glad you tuned in. Listen, this may be symbolic, but I wanted to, to give awards to those dialysis patients that's taking care of business, that's showing up to their treatments, that doing what they have to do to, to survive, to live this life, but not just, just live, but just to, to, to go on, to be alive and to thrive. And for you real hardworking ones, you got the big one right here. This is the big award right here to you. Because on this network, we love you, we care about you, and we're here for you. We're here to listen, and we're here to teach, and we're here to learn. Okay? So, now, I would like to introduce my guest. My guest, he's a director let me read it. How about that? He's a director of education and development, okay, for the National Kidney Register Exchange Program. One of the best in the world. One of the best in the world. And I'm going to have him tell you and explain to you all that he's offering with this wonderful program for every transplant patient out there who needs a transplant. His name is Joe Seneca. Joe Seneca, welcome you to the Lisa Baxter Show. Come on up in here. Come on up in here. Hi, Lisa. Nice to see you tonight. Hi, Joe. How are you? Doing great. It's a beautiful spring day today, wasn't it? Excellent. Excellent. Yes, it was a beautiful day. I had the coat with me. I put it on. I took it <laughs> off and I had to put it back on. How about that? <laughs> You know, so um, we had met at uh, we met at the uh, Rogerson table discussion one year, That's right, a couple the years round ago, table back, discussion. right? That's right. And that was and, and that we was were, a follow up. That was a follow up to the, uh, the oh, yeah, yeah. The White House. Remember that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And also at the event when I got the award with um, with Julia and she was on the show. She was my first guest on the show a couple of weeks ago. Yes. So yes. see, we, we all in the same circles That's doing right. great things for people together, right? Absolutely. All right. All right. Now, one of the things I wanted to ask you is um, what is a day like in doing your kind of work? We're going to go. We're gonna, I'm going to break you up piece by piece about what sure. you do. But what is a day like in in your kind of work that you do with uh, uh, the kidney registry? Well, it's, it's very hectic. Um, you know, there are a lot of people uh, in need of a kidney transplant. And mm -hmm. uh, people who um, make it through into our program, they register at hospitals that are registered in our program, um, yes. are being, you know, run through this matching system on a daily basis. And we look to try to create these kidney exchanges, which I'm sure we can talk more more detail about further down the line here on the show. Um but we're busy every day um, working with the hospitals, getting them to enter their patients and their patients' donors into our systems. Uh, and that's the first piece, the most important piece. It's like the lottery. You have to be in it to win it, right? So we have yes. to get the patients all entered into our systems so that towards the end of the day, we can start to run our matching system and create these kidney swaps where we're exchanging people's donors for a better match. Uh, with that come a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that have to be perfectly in place and defined. There's a lot of data, uh, people's blood types and people's uh, tissue types and all that. Everything has to be all perfect in the system. Um, mm -hmm. And the hospitals have a lot to learn about how to use our systems to take the best advantage of the tools that we've built for them in order to do this. 
Um, so there's a lot of questions that come in on a daily basis. We're on the phone with the personnel at the hospitals, the nurses, the doctors, the scientists, and so forth. Uh, and we're kind of running that. And that's just for the matching piece. Then yes. once we make these matches, we get very busy to work on the logistics. Because if uh, you have a donor and you need a kidney and you have a donor, but they're not compatible, and uh, we find a way to swap your donor with someone else's donor on the same day, there's logistics involved in that. And <coughs> bless you. And the kidney could be coming from a thousand miles away. So we have to arrange the logistics to make sure that uh, we have a way to pick it up at the right time of day and get it to the uh, recipient hospital in a timely manner. So all the surgeries can be, the transplants can be performed. The logistics uh -huh. are very complicated. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And our operations people work on, um, uh, you know, dealing with all those things, all those details on a daily basis. Uh, and then I'm spending a lot of time going out to the hospitals, uh, flying out to the hospitals and doing presentations uh, to help educate the personnel at the hospital on how to have mm -hmm. discussions with their patients because they have to educate their patients in order for the patients to make an informed decision on, on whether they should or shouldn't utilize our uh, program. I agree. I had to do that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Continue. Um, so, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, um, challenges in transplant, you know, anything can cause a transplant to be postponed or canceled. Uh, patients, you know, get sick, donors get yes. sick. Uh, sometimes donors back out. Sometimes patients have second thoughts about whether they really want to move forward with the transplant. If there are other medical issues, you know, as you know, firsthand that when you're on dialysis, there are a lot of other medical issues that you could have yes. while you're on dialysis. Um, some of those things can interfere with your ability uh, to be able to uh, move forward uh, medically uh, and safely for a transplant. Mm -hmm. And most importantly for the donor, you know, people who donate their kidneys when they're living are doing something that is really amazing. Uh, a living donor is basically going to a doctor who's going to take that kidney out of this person and operate yes. on this person. And this person is not sick. If anybody ever heard of something called the Hippocratic Oath, which is what doctors uh, okay. take this oath when they become a doctor, which means the Hippocratic Oath means to do no harm. So they're kind of putting a donor in a little bit of risk because it's surgery. Every kind of surgery has risks. So it took a long time for doctors to uh, come to terms with, you know, even using living donors. Of course, we've been doing living donors uh, as a com transplant community for many decades mm -hmm. now. Uh, but... Um, you know, they really have to make sure the donor is absolutely 100% healthy um, and they won't move forward with the donation if that person's not healthy. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, time that goes into a lot of donors get declined, not because they're particularly unhealthy, but because um, if they're not in absolutely, you know, tip top health, they don't want to put the donor under any major risk. Joe, excuse me. Can you stay in the center of the screen? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Believe it or not, I can't see you. Oh, wow. Yeah, but better? I know Steve can see you. Is that better? So, okay. So, um, yeah. Well, what has made you... I, I know you have a, a strong passionate about this. Yes. So, what has made you passionate about doing this work? The numbers. Mm -hmm. We know that right now... Uh, there's approximately 135,000 people waiting for solid organs. That includes kidneys, livers, uh, hearts, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, of those 134,000 people, 94,000 of them are waiting for a kidney. And, um, wow. and those are just the people who have been registered and have agreed to be considered for transplantation period. Mm -hmm. So they're waiting on the deceased do donor organ donor list in order to receive a kidney. So the majority of the people who are on the wait list for any kind of organ are kidney recipients. Of course, part of the reason why there's more people waiting for kidneys than there are for hearts is that because we have this thing called dialysis. Dialysis yes. is a is a way to allow people to continue to live as their kidneys are not working right. Um, without the dialysis, they could die. Wow. Dialysis is, as you know, is is not 
nearly as good as having a functioning kidney and it has, there are medical challenges. So the better form of treatment, when you look at the statistics uh, of, of patient survival and health is uh, transplantation. You know, if you're going to make a decision, if you could do one or the other right now, all right, we have a kidney for you or you can stay on dialysis. What are you going to accept? You're going to take the kidney because you know it's going to better your life. So sure. knowing that there are so many people on that wait list and that there sadly are a number of people dying every year on the wait list. It is means sad. We have yeah. a lot of work to do. All right. We, we got 3000 people transplanted no, no. in our paired exchange program uh, since we started 11 years ago. Okay. As great of a number as that is that we're still scratching the surface. Like there's a lot more work to be done because there's a really lot more, a lot more say that. Right. Mm -hmm, and, and, sure. and, and there's there's a lot more people on the wait list who haven't gotten a kidney yet. Uh, some of them might have someone in their circle of family and friends who might be healthy enough to be a living donor. But they these people don't even know that there's an opportunity to exchange your kidney with someone else uh, if you're not a match for your, the person you intend to donate. And some of them had tried years ago. And we're told you're not compatible with your brother or your friend or your cousin, whomever you were trying to donate to. And they went off and they went off with their lives and never looked back. They said, well, I'm not compatible with my friend. So, you know, I moved on with my life because even for the donor, it's a big decision to want to move forward or donate or not. So, um, you know, once they kind of, of you know, or, or no longer have their head wrapped around this concept of being a donor, they move on with their life and it's over. That's it. So now the person sits there on the wait list for a deceased donor organ yeah, waiting yeah. with all the other people, you know? So, so, you know, going back to answer your question again, um, it's the yes. numbers, it's the numbers. And also too, uh, when I first was given this opportunity to move into this field, yes. I came from an entirely different field. All right. I came from the field of, of printing and mailing for the financial industry. It was a very lucrative business, but most of that type of printing is gone. Everybody gets their, you know, their statements in the mail and email now and not in, uh, in, in the ma in, in, in mailbox. Right. So, uh, you know, I was looking for something else to do, but when I heard about the numbers, I, I come from a Christian upbringing. I'm a, I'm a diehard Catholic. Yeah. Oh yeah. Devout, Me too. And, and, I know what you mean. Okay. You know, so I'm devout with my faith and I always remember the story of the good Samaritan, the gospel story. And the good Samaritan was, he was the only guy who was willing to stop by and, and help this person who was dying on the side of the road. Well, to me, that's my Lord calling me, you know, this field to do something. You know, when I saw the numbers and I needed a different career because my other career was, was going away, I needed to do something else. And I looked at this, God is calling me to do something different, you know, yeah. and it's a hard transition and it's hard work. Um, you know, and, I'm sure it is, you know, you know uh, I'm sure it is because you know? it can be frustrating. I'm sure, right. you know, you care about people, you want to help them, you want right. to do something. And sometimes you, you only can do what you can do. And so far, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Listen, I have a whole team of people. Of course, my boss is, is his brilliance it takes a team. His drive uh, behind us together. We've all done this, you know, and, uh, you know, I've been there since the beginning, but I work with the best people. Uh, I've ever worked with in my life. Uh, wow. They're all dedicated, uh, all very smart. Uh, my boss is a brilliant guy. Um, uh, he's uh, he's passionate about this, and we're all passionate with him. And you know, we're all a great crew, together, a know? great crew. Well, you know, it takes teamwork to make the dream work. My bishop always <laughs> says, Archbishop Roger. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. well, what is one of your success stories? I, maybe you have more than one, but one is your, what is one of your success stories? Because out of all of this, even though you have a, you know, a deep day with the calls and the, the visits and the, you know, going to the hospitals and linking up and getting together, what is one of your success, success stories about some of this? Well, um, let me start off by going back a little bit when we first started doing this. Um, all right. One of the things that we were trying to do was, you see, when we do these paired kidney exchanges, we typically have a good Samaritan donor who comes forward and says, I'd like to donate a kidney to a stranger. Uh, and they put, we put them in the pool and then we start making the matches. And then this person 
we realize it's a match for this family here, right? And this person, yes. and then that person's donor donates to someone else and it forms a chain. We call this a donor chain and the chain keeps going. Mm. When we first started doing this, we only had a limited number of these Good Samaritan donors. So what we used to do is we used to try to keep the chain going as long as we could. But the longer you make the chain, the more links there are in the chain, the more places there are that it could break. And wow. the whole thing kind of fall, starts to fall apart. Uh, right. And it's a lot of work. And when you do it that way, sometimes you may get less people transplanted in the long run because you're spending so much time working on one long chain. Well, the first big chain that we did was, well, the bit, the first time we did the biggest chain, the longest chain was a, um, it was a uh, 30 way kidney swap. So that's a total of uh, uh, 60 surgeries, 30 donors and 30 recipients. And that took place over dozens of transplant centers all across the country. And, um, it was a lot of work. It took us several months to pull it off. But when, wow. the, while the chain was going on, we had a, um, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from the New York Times approach us. His name is Kevin Sack. In fact, mm -hmm. the guy is such a good journalist. He won mm -hmm. the Pulitzer Prize twice. <laughs> it's hard enough to win it once. We don't want to, the guy's a real character and he's a brilliant writer. Mm -hmm. So he followed this chain to all the hospitals and he met with all the recipients and he flew around and when he was done he put the story together and, and he proposed it to the, the the editors at the new york times and he would this, this process takes mm -hmm. weeks and weeks and even months and he kept emailing us saying hey back and and about this it's going to run sometime in the next week they're going to give it a pretty good ride in the in their time so finally we get the call on friday saying it's going to run in the Sunday New York Times. We said, wow, this is huge, right? So yeah. um, Saturday night comes and you get the electronic post of the Sunday New York Times first before you see the printed copy of it. So we saw the story. We read it. It's about 11 o'clock at night on Sunday. And I said, wow, this is a great. It was so well done. They put a map of the, the, the centers and the chain and all pictures of all the people in it. So then the next time morning, I say, let me run over to the local deli and pick up a copy of the paper and i look down and what do i see on the paper front page above the fold the entire top half of the front page of the sunday new york times was the pictures of all the people on this kidney swap and it was the feature story of that uh -huh. i mean there's only 52 Sunday New York Times in one year, and we uh, the busiest uh -huh. that we've ever had. By wow, so that got a call to the best on down that she was gonna, uh, you know, interview him and so forth, and that really kind of, you know, put us on the map nationally. You know, everybody in the, in, the, in the country knew who we were at this point. Wow. So it got a little that, crazy. That's the kind of of uh, exposure you need sometimes. You know, right. sometimes you're doing something on a small scale and somebody, exactly. you know, see your vision or hear about it and put it out there. That's such a that's big right. thing. It really is. So, um, and like I said before, you know, we don't really work directly with the patients. We work with the hospitals. It's not our job to work directly with the patients and the okay. donors. Uh, because we're not doctors, we're not nurses, so they should be in the capable hands of the staff. You know these people, you've dealt with them. They're very capable people, they're very um, professional, um, and uh, they know how to you know, balance your, the needs between you, know, you needing to understand what's going to happen mm -hmm. and your options versus you know, your medical situation, because everybody's situation is a little different. So we want them to handle all that. So we never really get, we've, I don't want to say never, but we rarely get to meet the people that we're transplanting in the kidney swap. It's very rare that we ever see the yeah. patients. It's very rare that we see the donors uh, because we have to work with uh, depersonalized informa uh, information. We don't know their names, you know? Uh, and uh, so some days, you know, you know, we're getting all, we're doing all this work and we're getting all these matches and we're getting all these transplants done. And every once in a while, we just have to stop and say, there's real people behind here at, that are sitting at the hospital right now. Either, uh, you know, they're going to get matched in one of our transplants or they're were just matched and we just delivered the kidney today, you know, and it's kind of surreal sometimes, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But when well, we do get to meet them from time well, to time, it's really I special. mean, Joe... 
excuse me, Joe. Go ahead. Let me ask you a question. If a person wanted to work in this type of job or volunteer with it, um, what would you say to them or how would they go about it? Well, um, you know, we don't, we have, a very, you know, we have a very small team. It's very specialized. Um, we don't really have, you know, volunteers coming in really to work with us. Um, okay. Really, uh, the volunteers really happen um, at the hospitals. They happen at the organ procurement organizations, uh, otherwise known as OPOs, which there are uh, many states have several of them. You know, like there's Live On New York, which covers like kind of yeah. the New York area here. Them. They have a lot of volunteers. So that those are the areas where yeah, they, I volunteer with them myself. Yeah, so yeah. you've been there. Um, those are the places where the volunteers work. But for us, you know, mm-hmm. because it's all technology based and we're moving the data and we're, we're organizing all of the logistics, we don't really have, um, you know, any you know, really volunteers coming in and work with our program. We don't need it. Um, right, right. In fact, you know, even though we're a nonprofit organization, the hospitals are covering the cost of, it costs us to run our services and stuff. So it's not like we, we're not really doing, you know, much fundraising or anything like that. And we right. did that in the beginning just to kind of help jumpstart it. But once we kind of got up and running, but you don't we need it now. You need to do that anymore, you know? Mm. Well, you, you, um, now that you're doing this on a, a, a larger scale, what if a person, since you're doing this internationally, right? We, you know, we're trying to do it internationally, but we haven't had good success outside of the U.S. because there's a lot of, oh, okay. uh, there's a lot of geopolitical barriers and regulatory issues that make it very difficult. For example, uh, Canada actually has a, their own parrot exchange program which has had some reasonable success. They've done about a thousand pair of kidney exchanges uh-huh. since they started as well, which is, is, is notable. Uh, but they have some challenges. Like it's not, the regulations do not permit them to mm. ship kidneys. Wow. So when someone donates their kidney that, and whoever is receiving that kidney, they have to have the donor fly to the other hospital and wow. actually donate in the hospital where the recipient is receiving. They're not allowed to, pack the kidney up in a box and ship it just like we do here in the United States. Well, that's really hard. That slows you down. And it's very inconvenient for donors. We want donors to stay close to home where they have a support system. So after they donate their kidney, someone they know or love can come and kind of be with them and ultimately help them get home for their recovery and so forth. Uh, You know, you don't want donors having to get on a plane and fly a thousand miles to go home. You know, most of the kidney uh, matches that we make, I, jo- I, I always joke around with the hospitals, and it's actually true. What I'm about to say is that mm. rarely do the best matches in the paired kidney exchange ever come from any less than a thousand miles away. Because wow. it's, a, it's a genetic <laughs> diversity thing. You know, it's like if you're sitting here in New York and you have a donor that's incompatible, and we put you in the pool and we start running our matching system, chances are you're not going to find a match anywhere locally here. So in wow. one of these hospitals, but the match might show up at uh, in San Diego or at UCLA or, or in Seattle. Uh, yeah. And so then we're going to have to fly the kidney cross country for your patient to get it. And their donor here in New York is going to donate. And chances are it's going to be somewhere else. Maybe mm-hmm. their kidney who's, is going to someone in Texas or Chicago, you know. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, when I was uh, I was going on more than one list, I didn't get a chance to go on. But when I was going on more than one list, they told me I would have to fly to, to Florida right. and I would have to stay there a few months. But at the time, I was the caregiver for my husband and I could not go any place you know, or let anybody take care of him. You know, I wanted to be the one to take care of him. So I couldn't do that. So I had to forfeit that. Yes. And um, yeah, one thing I did see on right? TV about the chain, I was so surprised. I was glad to see that they started adding more stuff about dialysis and transplant on some of these TV shows. And I yeah. did see something with the uh, the thing you said about the uh, the chain. Yeah. And it's it, like you said, the bigger the chain, they started finding little problems because the chain got gotten bigger. That's right. You know, but they were able to fix it at some point, but it did get bigger and it caused some havoc and they were able to fix it. But I, I couldn't imagine that in real life happening and you're trying to fix it. So, you know, yeah, that's just there, interesting to know. I'm sure somebody that's looking today um, is listening about, you know, the pay exchange, you know, yeah. transplantation. I didn't have a live donor at a deceased donor. So at least with this, you're getting live donors. 
That's and right. they're supposed to last longer. So right. Yeah. yeah, and the only downside is, you know, you have in order for, for you to get one of these kidneys in our program, you have to come to the table to get with a donor in order mm. to be able to exchange it. Now, some people come to the table with a donor who actually is compatible. So mm. you might have, um, let's say you might have a 35-year-old woman who comes okay. in and her father uh, wants to donate to her and they've already cross-matched her and their blood types are the same. Uh, and the father who happens to be, you know, 64 years old mm. um, is actually an okay match, you know? Uh, mm. And they can put the, they can, Go schedule a surgery for a week from now and, and put the kidney in. But the problem is, is that she's getting a kidney from an older dad, you know, someone who's 35 years older than her. So um, what if she, instead of like going with her dad's kidney right away, what if they put her in the pool as what we call a compatible pair? And we try to see if we can give it for just a short amount of time, give it a month or maybe okay. 60 days, it was even better, and see if we can help tr her trade up to an even better match. So her father can go to some, her kidney can go to somebody in the pool who's already a little bit older. And maybe it's the other way around where someone in Texas has a, it's, it's the daughter donating to the father where the daughter's 30 and the father's 65. Well, now guess yes. what? This, this, on this side, this 65 year old kidney is going to a 65 year old man in Texas and his daughter's 30 year old kidney is coming here to this 30 year old woman. Uh, and both parties exchange on the same day and everybody wins. Everybody gets a better match in the long run, you know, and if they can get a better match, also a better, uh, antigen match, you know, um, where their tissue is more closer to their own, then the kidney could last even longer. Well, that's good. I mean, at least you have this thing working out or you, you guys have worked the kinks out of it, you know? Yeah. You and know, there's always um, additional, there, there's always additional barriers that we're working through every day. Uh, and we prioritize, we say, all right, what are the barriers that we're having today? Well, if we can speed up this or we can put this, you know, switch in the system that will make the system run better or make it easier for the hospitals to put more uh, patients in the program will we'll enhance the system to allow that and it allows us to move even faster you know we first started this we could barely get 20 transplants done in one year and last year we did 619 of them in one year so each year we keep growing and accelerating because we're finding ways to um, you know enhance the systems and enhance the process to make it even better uh, also too there are more transplant centers joining the program every year too wow yeah. See, we need programs like this, and yeah. it needs to be out there more that you're out there, you know. Yes. I mean, you know, know I knew a option. little bit from you and I talking, and then I knew a little bit from we were at the round table together, but now I'm, I'm hearing it a lot bigger. Even before this, before the show, when you and I, Steve, talked a little bit, I learned a little more. So each time I'm learning a little bit more, and I'm sure the people out there are also learning a little bit more. You Absolutely. know, for what you're giving, what you're talking about, you know, if if a person wanted a kidney, because uh, I'll say that next. But if a person if a person wanted a kidney or to be a part of this program, what would they have to do first? What's the steps? Well, I mean, the first the first thing is, um, you know, the, obviously the first question is, do you have a living donor, someone who's willing to right. be evaluated uh, by the, the hospital to become your donor? Okay. Donors, uh, number one. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Yes. So um, then you want to register and then you want to make sure you're registered at a hospital that's in our program, which if you go to our website, uh, there's a place where it says a map of transplant centers and you can look up the, you know, transplant centers are in the program. Because if you're at a yeah. hospital, there's a, there's a handful of hospitals out there around the country that haven't joined our program yet for, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. If they're not in our program, we can't help them. You know, so like, you know, here in New York, you know, there's uh, there's uh, three, at least three hospitals in New York City work with our program. We have Montefiore. Uh -huh. uh, Cornet, Joe, what's the website? Say, say it nice and loud. So everybody uh, out there you can hear to, you. To uh, www.kidneyregistry.org. That's uh -huh. kidneyregistry.org. Uh, you can you can you know go to a about us page and then there's a map of transplant centers. Uh, and then there's buttons there you can push. Like if you wanted to register at, with one of those hospitals, uh -huh. you can 
pick the button that fits your situation. There's two main buttons. One is I need a kidney. And the other one okay. is I, I um, you know, I want to donate my kidney. Uh, and there's oh, you know, wow. kind of a process there and there's information about how the program works and all that. Um, so that's, you know, that's how people get in. But, you know, just to simply just to see which transplant centers are in a program, because if they're at a hospital that happens to be on a program, when they walk in the door, all they have to do is say, I want to I want to explore paired kidney exchange through the National okay. Kidney Registry. That's all you have to say. Most hospitals will, will already you know, tell the patient this, but just in case they don't, you know, sometimes they might forget. Uh, it's yes. important for people to also ask the nurses there, you know, or tell mm -hmm. not ask them to tell them, I want to be considered for paired kidney exchange so that I can uh, get the best possible match in exchange for the kidney that my donor is donating into, into the program, you know? Wow. Well, I like, I like that you said on the website, there was a button, you know, you know, about, you know, being a, you know, wanting a transplant and wanting to be a donor. So that's a choice right there. Right. And then you also gave them the power to bring their own donor with them because right. sometimes you people act funny about strangers or right. people they don't know. Some people just do. So it's good that you gave them the option of bringing somebody. That's right. Cause that's the only yeah. way you can, that's the only way we can really help them is in an exchange. You know, if they're not, if they don't have a donor, as was your situation, then the only option is really uh, to make sure you're registered at, uh, you know, one of the well, yeah, programs. That's the main option. Who are you going to exchange with if there's nobody? That's right. You know, so then all you can do is be <laughs> on the deceased donor wait list uh, and pray that, you know, you know, your, your priority, you know, comes up so that you finally get that match offer for your kidney as you did. And, you know, thank God you did because you look wonderful, you know, uh, since yeah. you, you got a kidney. Uh, it's, it's life changing, you know? Yeah, it really is. It you is know? life changing, you know? And of course, you know, as you know, and you know, it's, there's the things you have to do to protect yourself after you get a kidney, uh, yeah. like your immunosuppression medications and things like that, you know, those are not, uh, they're not optional. They, you know, whatever they tell you, you, you should be taking, you know, you have to take those because if you don't, you put your own kidney at risk and, uh, you know, it's hard to get a second one. <laughs> it's hard enough I to get the first you. one, you know, <laughs> you know, yes. Now you're working with several hospitals, you said, right? Yeah. No, we have this, we have about 90, now, 90. Suppose I'm on a list at a, a debt. I'm on a list at a hospital that's not registered with you. What will I do in that case? Well, it's, and it's not easy. Uh, you have to not see easy. if you okay. can get trans transferred to one of the other hospitals that's in our program. You know, the good okay. news is that uh, most of the, uh, the big transplant programs throughout the country are in our, they're, they're already in our program. You know, there's only a handful of okay. centers that are not participating in our program yet. Okay. Uh, and we continue to work on with them, you know, to say, hey, listen, uh, you know, I, I may work, talk to the hospital and say, listen, you really should consider joining my program because I can help your patients. I, you know, I, you, I see, you know, I tell them, you know, I'm not a salesman. OK, but I like everybody, that. Listen, everybody's a salesman, you know, but but, you know, I'm not my job is not to go out and just be a salesman, you know, knocking on doors. Hey, uh, would you like to join my program? No. My, my, my job is to go out and educate the centers on their options so they can educate their patients on those options that could be achieved by using our program. And if they're not interested, then I walk away. I'm not going to, I'm not going to call them every week or every month and saying, Hey, you know, what's up? You know, because if they're not, you know, they have to put some effort into this as well. Yes. There's a lot of work that the hospitals have to do in order to comply with our workflows and our program. So, like, if, if their heart's not in it, they won't be successful in my program. Uh, I've seen that happen, too. And sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes they don't have the resources or they don't have the nurse coordinators or they don't have enough surgeons on staff uh, yeah, to work I've on a program. You know, uh, so, so, you know, that's, that's a whole other issue. But um, some big, there's a couple of big hospitals out there that are water. They're trying to do this under their own roof. Mm hmm because they have a lot of patients and donors under their roof and they want to try to make their own little chains under their own roof. But, you know, you can do that, but you have a limited size pool of options to make matches from. You see in mm -hmm. my pool, because I have 90 transplant centers 
all contributing patients and donors in the pool, the pool size is so much bigger that the possibilities of possible matches in the exchanges uh, are, are greater. You know, it's a math, it's a simple math game, you know. The more yeah, you have in yeah. there, the more possibilities you have at the back end of it. Um, so that's, I, you know, these are the cases that I make to these hospitals to try to, uh, you know, to work, uh, you know, w- with my program as opposed to trying to go it alone, you know. Wow. Well, at least it's a start, you know. You know, if I, if, well, you said transferring it would be hard. If I did all the, uh, the, the, the um, tests, you know, all the tests, you know, yeah. the, the trend mill, the, yeah. the, you know, the GYN and all of the, all of the long, 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 long tests. When I transfer, um, all of that work goes with it or do I have to do it all over again? Yeah, um, it should. You know, technically, they should be willing to release your medical records. Uh, OK. And, and, you know, but the, the hospitals yeah. are very. They can be they can be a little bit reluctant to mm-hmm. to transfer people's medical records. Uh, it's just the nature of, of the field. But the patients have to demand it. Uh, and, you know, there comes a point you try to get as many of your medical records transferred over to the other hospital as possible. And then if for some reason they don't get it all, you might have to repeat some of the tests. But, you know, you get to a point where, OK, I've been waiting too long <laughs> to, for them to get off their feet and, you know, transfer all the paperwork over. So let me just have the hospital just re- rerun the tests and let's keep moving here because, you know, mm-hmm. you're, this is your life. You know, you, you, you have to yes. fight. You have Definitely. To fight. You know, um, it's definitely your life. Yes. You know, it, uh, it's definitely your life. Wow. Yeah. I'm telling you, we all have to fight for we all have to advocate. And, you know, that's why a lot of people, too, um, they have someone in their circle of family or friends, even if they can't be their donor. That person becomes their caretaker to help yeah. them, because, you know, listen, you again, you know this personally, right? You were on dialysis. Uh, it takes a lot out of you. You could be yeah. tired. You can be a little foggy some days and sometimes having somebody with you when you're, you know, a loved one who cares about you, who's going to be listening and interacting with the hospitals. If they're not giving you the answers that that you you deserve, that person might be more quick to say, hey, wait a minute, you're not giving us the answer we want to hear here. You know what I'm saying? Um, But not everybody has that luxury. Some people, they, they have no choice but to go it alone. You know, because like in your case, you, you were the caretaker of your own husband. So it's not like your husband could be there with you. You know, I don't know if you had other people in there with you. Well, it was the other way around at first when I was the one on dialysis before he got colon cancer. Yeah. But he was a match for me to have the kidney. And wow. uh, he developed high blood pressure and they wouldn't let us do it. Right. But right. when I um, put him to rest, I didn't remember to take the kidney even though we were a match. I forgot all oh. about it. Somebody asked me six months later. I didn't remember, right. you know. So, you know, wow. But, um, yeah, you need somebody. See, he was tired of me going through that dialysis for so long. Sometimes oh, it takes somebody to love you enough to want to do that. I kept telling him, you don't got to do it. Let me wait on the list. You right. know, it's not really bothering me. I was healthy on dialysis, believe it or not. Well, it so, didn't yeah, stop yeah. my life. You know, I had, you know, a few times I passed out, but that was a little blood pressure, you know. Sure, sure. But I'm just saying, you know. Yeah. But um, but some people, some people don't do very well at all on dialysis, and they're very, very sick, Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. Wow. I have a, I have a friend. Uh, his dad is 92 years old and he's on dialysis and he's been on dialysis for 10 years. And if you wow. look at the man, you'd have no idea. First of all, you'd have no idea that he's 92. Second of all, you have no idea he, he's even on dialysis. But God love him. You know, he just he looks wonderful, you know, you know, but in his case, he's too old to even get a transplant. They would never operate on a 92 year old man, you know. Wow. Uh, so he's that that's his, his, his thing. He's on. Now, he's a very prayerful, uh, faithful man, and really, the grace of God has, has really kept him um, kept him alive longer. I believe this, you know? Wow. Well, you know, some people really hang in there. You know, some people wait faithfully on the list. Some people have had more than one transplant. Yeah. And they don't mind getting a, you know, I know one person had three. And they didn't mind getting wow. getting one again and again. You know, some people are scared of the knife, and then some people... Well, you know, try, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, uh, I'm i glad you're doing this work. I'm glad you're doing this type of work, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you came on the show and everything, oh, you know. Really, so uh, I appreciate nice that. 
yeah. you know what you know what you're doing and how you're doing it. We have something called, and I'm gonna say this: we have something called uh, uh, kidney, uh, no, quest. What has to do with transplant? And uh -huh. um, I uh, that's an excellent show. If you go on Urban, you will see that that show, and they might need you either on it or to work with them or something like that. I don't know if you do that type of thing. I'm just throwing it out there just in case. Mm -hmm. All right, Jared is a sweet person. Yeah. Warriors Quest. That's Warriors, what it's called. Warriors Quest. I'm writing right. it down. <laughs> and Jared Brown, he's he's excellent. He's the host of that show. Interesting. A sweet person, you know. Yeah. So I'm. Um, um, thank you again for coming on. I thank Barbara for tuning in. Thank you, Barbara. You know, I thank everybody out there also for coming on and, and taking time to spend a nice evening with the Lisa Baxter show. Uh, this is uh, from the heart and not from the head. We love you out there. We want you healthy. We want you strong. We want you feeling good, feeling better, and being educated about your illness. All right? So we thank you again for tuning in. We thank you again for coming on, and we hope to see you next week. All right? So prayers, blessings, and peace, and thank you, and good night.